Good morning, Westwood Church, and welcome to church. Good morning. Is this not great to be together again in the house of the Lord, worshiping together? I want to invite you uh, in, those who are in the lobby, uh, to come and to join. And welcome to those who are on our uh, online community. Big welcome to you as well, where, wherever you are and uh, wherever you're sitting right now. We're so glad that we can be worshiping together. Now, over the last number of months, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about um, why, why does the church gather when, you've, when, the church, when the church has sort of been disconnected, when the body of Christ has been disconnected for such a long period of time, a period of time really that, that none of us have ever really experienced, uh, where someone else kind of imported some, some guidelines and some restrictions on us. Um, 16 months is a long time. And so people, uh, even like disciples of Christ, the body of Christ, they, they ask questions. You know, like, what, what's the purpose of the church? Who are we? Why do we meet? Why do we gather? And they're good questions. Um, and so I, I've been asking myself some of these questions as well over the last months. Why do we gather? And, and whenever those restrictions are, are kind of lifted... How will, we, how will we approach it? What will we do? How will we move back in to a different reality? Because the reality is, is that things will never be the same. That's just the nature of, of life. And so I've thought, about, I've thought about this question. Why does the church gather? And I was asking the Lord um, th this question. And the word that he seemed to be bringing back to me again and again was, was this phrase to give voice, to give voice. And I'm like, okay, to give voice. Well, what does that mean? And so as I kind of processed it, and I continue to think about it, I don't think my thinking is fully developed or it's complete yet, but, but this is what I believe God was saying to me as, as I was you know, conversing with him and seeking his word. To give voice, in what way? Well, several ways. First, I think that the people of God give voice when we declare our worship to God who is worthy to be worshipped. The psalm says, uh, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So when we gather, the people of God in community declare God's goodness. We give voice in a vertical relationship to God. So, so that's kind of the first thing that that kind of was coming to mind as I was developing these thoughts. The second kind of um, way that we give voice is on a horizontal level with one another as the people of God and as people who are seeking uh, God and, and truth. And so we give voice when God's people declare his work in us and among us. So last Sunday, when we regathered uh, kind of a first time with no restrictions, that is what we experienced. We experienced God's people declaring um, how God was at work within and among us. And wasn't that amazing for those of us who were here and for those who were watching online to hear what God is doing? Some hard stories, some encouraging stories, but it's God at work. And so we give voice to that when we actually gather together and we share. And we want to be doing more of that as we move forward. The third thing uh, that I see as we give voice and the purpose for gathering is God desires to have his voice spoken into our lives. So we give voice when we declare God's goodness. We give voice when we declare God's work among us. And we give voice when we allow God to speak to his people through his word, that which he's already shared with us. And we come around it and we hear from him and we hear from one another as to how God is at work. So gathering together is really, really important. And I am trying to uh, gain a greater sense for that, and I hope that you are as well, as we find ourselves again uh, in community in ways that we haven't yet experienced. So I'm excited about worshiping together with each and every one of you this morning. I want to invite you to stand with us as we declare God's goodness in worship. And so, Lord, we just come together as your people, as people seeking truth, as people desiring a vibrant relationship with you. 
uh, we just declare your goodness. We welcome you here. We thank you that you're among us. We thank you that you want to work in and through us. And so we just lift up our voice to you in praise. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. And God's people everywhere, online and in this room, said, Amen. Amen. And I hope you heard that online.
Jesus, I thank you so much that yeah, we can, again, be in here, and uh, this is exciting to see people, and we can sing, and I just thank you for the blessing that is, God. Um, thank you for, yeah, the opportunity that we have to come sing and worship you, God, and I just pray that you bless this service and uh, just help us to be uh, just attentive to what you're saying to us, God, and to be able to hear your voice. Thank you that you speak to us, and thank you that you love us. Amen. Amen. Uh, feel free to be seated. And uh, I, want to, uh, I want to welcome Elliot Morris and thank him for uh, stepping in this morning. Um, got a phone call late last evening that uh, Andrew, our scheduled worship leader, uh, was down and out with, uh, with sickness. And so, uh, so we kind of had to do a little bit of uh, adjusting. And so um, Elliot um, grew up at Westwood. He's a little boy. Um, this was where his family worshipped. And um, they, they shifted on uh, some, some time ago, 
um, but he's been a student at, uh, at Prairie Bible College and studying worship arts and biblical studies and pursuing uh, God's call to, to ministry in some fashion, pastoral ministry. And um, we've been blessed uh, in our city as he kind of develops his leadership roots. And so he's uh, been interning at Fort George Baptist for the last couple of summers. And he was so willing to step in in the gap uh, last evening and help us out a little bit. And so can we just thank him uh, for doing that? Because um, you know, I could have, I probably could have called up any of you, but I'm not so sure. Uh, you know, like Glenn Workington, would, maybe you would have come on up and like, <laughs> uh, yeah. So so thankful, Elliot. Now. Um, Elliot uh, had the privilege this last week, uh, last year, as a, a student of uh, worship arts and uh, music ministry. He had the opportunity to, uh, as part of his program, to uh, to write and to produce an album. Um, and so this morning, I, I actually asked him if he would bless our church family with one of the songs that he's written called "With Us." Now, there's a story behind it. And it has to do with COVID. And as a student, he was kind of stuck, you know, in an institution within all kinds of restrictions and walls and so forth. And so last Sunday, if you were here, you were watching online, um, you heard a lot of stories of people's um, struggles and their journey through this last year, year and a bit because of COVID and and some of the challenges that came with it. And um, Elliot, as a student, was also... um, experiencing some of those things. And so one of the songs uh, that he wrote and then produced um, kind of comes out of that. So, Elliot, do you want to just share a little bit about the background of that story, or about the song? Yeah. So, so this song is actually the first song that I wrote at Prairie. So I did two years, so I guess that would have been two years ago. Um, and it was, yeah, my first song that I wrote in my songwriting class, and I wrote it, and it, was, it came out of this prayer because I didn't know what to do in life. And, and um, we had this guest worship leader come in, and, and she helped me sort of make it more congregational because it was very, like, just personal, and, and that was awesome, and, and I wrote it, and it was great, and then it just sat, and I, I came to school um, for my second year, which was last year, and was writing more songs and, and putting my, my EP together, and I was, like, just, just lost. I'm like, okay, I have, like, one more spot. I didn't know what to fill it with, and then I was scrolling through, like, all my notes of random ideas and thoughts and lyrics, and there's this song that I just completely forgot about. I, I don't know how. And, and I was just like, oh my gosh, this has to be on the album. So I, I kind of revamped it a bit and, and wrote it. But as I was rewriting it and, and uh, as I was like recording it, it, it was just, it was cool because it was written in a time before COVID and where I was just kind of confused and lost about like my direction in life. But then it spoke to me in this way that, that changed because we were at school, and I mean, I was really lucky. I got to go to school in person, so I felt bad for all my friends here that were stuck online. So it wasn't the, the worst thing, but it's still, there's still, like, tough things, and, and this song just really spoke to me and, as I was writing it and, and recording. So it was, it was really cool. Yeah. Well, thank you for being willing to bless us with it, and uh, we can probably purchase the song after, right? Like, I don't know. It's on, <laughs> it's on streaming services. Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> bless you.
It's easy to know the words you've spoken But do we hold them in our hearts? Cause we need to lose our ways to find you And put you first Oh, we put you first Cause you were always with us Standing at a side, open up her eyes, Lord. You want to be revived. You were always with us. Standing at a side, open up her eyes, Lord. You want to be revived. You're a light before our feet, Lord. In the dark, you show the way. We'll trust in your love and grace, for you've made every day. When we cry out to you, Lord, you hear every phrase. And even in the valley, you're worthy of all our praise. You're a light before our feet. Dark, you show the way. We'll trust in your love and grace, for you've made every day. When we cry out to you, Lord, you hear every phrase. And even in the valley, you're worthy of all our praise. You with us, standing at a side, open up her eyes, Lord, we want to be revived, you were always with us, standing at a side, open up her eyes, Lord, we want to be revived. Thank you so much, Elliot. Bless you, and bless you as you go and lead worship at Fort George Baptist. Thank them for borrowing you to us today. Thank you. <clears throat> um, boy, that's great. I uh, really appreciate his, uh, his willingness and his leadership today. I want to invite uh, the crew from Westwood that's serving at Nestle Bible Camp to, uh, this summer to come and join me on the platform. Um, one of the things that I, I shared uh, in our kind of welcome to our service this morning was uh, giving voice to what God is doing among us and around us, and we've been praying for different ministries and churches. And uh, so this morning, we're actually going to have the opportunity to hear a little bit about what God is doing at uh, Nest Lake Bible Camp uh, this summer, and specifically um, see a little bit of our, uh, they're just kind of doing their walk through the Lysol wipe thing. It's okay. It's okay. Good, good, good. Excellent. Um, we have the opportunity to hear a little bit about uh, what God is doing uh, through a lot of our folks who are serving uh, at Nestle Bible Camp um, through Westwood. Uh, coming into the summer, we didn't really know uh, how things were going to go, whether or not we would be able to do children's ministry at, at, at Westwood. Um, boy, you guys are hiding in the, like, dark. Come, come, over here, here, awesome. Um, we didn't know how we would be able to serve kids, if we would be able to serve kids. And so um, we started talking uh, as, a, as a leadership core, uh, Pastor Twyla, Pastor David, myself. We, we said, what if we were to um, really get behind Nestle Bible Camp because we, we were pretty confident camps could be able to do uh, work with children and youth. And so we started a conversation back in winter with uh, Elliot Harder, who's with us this morning. And over the course of the months, a plan developed, and we just said, we just want to come around you and underneath you and serve in whatever way possible, as a church family, in wherever you need us. And so that was kind of the approach we took, and uh, these are some of the folks who are serving, not all of them through Westwood, but some of them, and we want to uh, thank them so much for um, joining us this morning. 
So um, at Nest Lake Bible Camp, there's all kinds of opportunities to serve. And the folks on the platform are serving in a variety of different roles. And we're going to hear a little bit about uh, some of them today. Let me just kind of look behind you. There we go. We're going to start with the work crew. Uh, work crew is kind of your entry level um, ministry opportunity at Nestle Bible Camp. Would that be true, Elliot? Yeah? Okay. And so, um, so we've got a couple of folks who are on work crew uh, this, uh, this morning. And uh, I think we're starting with you, Colin, right? Like, describe the life of a work crew member at Nestle Lake Bible Camp. So, like, are you a slave to Nestle Lake, or what's the deal? <laughs> describe the, the daily life. Okay, so our day starts early in the morning at, like, 7.30. Um, we have to set for breakfast. Um, and then we eat breakfast, and... Then we have our first round of chores. And this summer, there's kind of two main chores that we're doing, which is cleaning bathrooms and cleaning the dishes. Um, so there are two crews out of our total group. Um, so half of us do bathrooms, and then half of us do dishes. So once we're finished with, um, with those chores, then if we're finished early, we have a bit of hanging out time. And then we have to set the tables for lunch. And <laughs> kind of repeats, we eat lunch, and then second round of chores, um, clean bathrooms, <laughs> do lunch dishes. And then... Um, A pattern's developing here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so there's usually around two hours after those afternoon chores that um, free to hang out with your crew. Um, it's been really hot the past few weeks, so we've been just chilling at the waterfront and going swimming every day, tubing, um, playing card games for those who don't want to swim. Nice. And then we have to get ready and set for dinner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, we set for dinner, eat dinner, third round of chores, dishes, um, bathrooms, and <laughs> lots of eating in bathrooms. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And um, and then we're done. Um, we might watch an alpha video with the crew. Um, I forgot to mention that we also do devotions in the morning after breakfast. We don't go immediately into chores. <laughs> we finish. <laughs> Start the day off right with Jesus. Exactly. Excellent. Okay, that's what we like to hear. Awesome. Perfect. <laughs> First. Awesome. Um, awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Colin. So uh, servant leadership, bathrooms, setting tables, really kind of humble stuff, but also having opportunities to be a part of a, a bigger crew doing kind of fun stuff. Um, so epic experience, most epic experience so far in work crew. Uh, who, who, Justin, are you on? Perfect. Yeah, and I like your shirt today. It's going to go well in live streaming. I thank can you. see that already. Uh, yeah. uh, the most epic experience was probably when we did like this jousting thing on the water. Um, we were on these little like floating pads thing and we had these sticks and we were whacking each other. And the most epic battle of the epic time was Colin and Adriana going at it. <laughs> Very vicious. Very vicious, okay. Yeah. I may have to have a chat with them after. They both won around. Okay. So we'll, have, we'll go to a battle, battle royale next week or something like that. Yeah. Nice. Um, I'm not sure if it's Tyler or Brianna. Um, best experience so far in work crew? Sure, you betcha, absolutely. Tyler, okay. best experience or favorite memory or, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, the question was slightly different. Um, Perfect, go with the question that you had. Well, the question that I got was, um, what is my favorite part about work crew? Yeah. And I think my favorite part about work crew is that we're both camper and not camper. So we get a little bit more freedom than you know, like campers do, so like we're not like always like doing this specific activity. There's always like, you can always, like after chores and stuff, we can hang out. And that can be a number of things. So we get a little bit more option and it's, I think that's my favorite part about work crew. Nice. And Brianna, let's uh, fire it off to you. Um, my favorite part, for me at least, was actually on Friday. We had a meeting and we decided we we're going to start hanging out with the campers and getting to know like what an LAP and cabin leader is like and I got to sit with a cabin for cabin discussion and all these kids it was really fun just 
watching them and how quickly they knew the answers to all these questions about Jesus and just how sweet and funny the kids are. Yeah. Nice. So, so those were some of the work crew members, uh, not all of them, but they're from Westwood, and that's kind of what we want to share with you. So they're kind of this entry-level kind of uh, introduction to service, to, to ministry service at CAP, um, but they kind of get overseen by a work crew boss. And that boss happens to be the older sister of this young man here. My life so, is complete because I beat him once. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a size differential you're going to see here. So Adriana is, uh, is one of the work crew bosses. And so tell us a little bit, Adriana, how does, how does camp ministry contribute to a young person's leadership development? Because that's, that's part of the process. So when I first heard this question, my initial response was actually, how doesn't it? Um, I was like, that's a huge question. Um, I'd have to think about that a little bit. And kind of what I, um, so many things about how camp ministry lends itself to leadership development. But um, one of the first things I thought about was the fact that camp expects a lot out of very uh, unqualified young people. I'm very young to be a work crew boss. I feel very young sometimes. Um, but I think in my inadequacy, I am forced to rely on the Lord in a much different and greater way. Um, and I think ultimately a leader who relies on the Lord is going to be the best leader. So I would say that was one of my, the initial things I thought about. Another really cool thing about camp is that you're working with a lot of people and a lot of different people. So you're not leading alone. Um, but working with a lot of people means a lot of different strengths, a lot of different weaknesses, a lot of different quirks. Um, so <laughs> things like patience, um, communication is huge. You have to communicate with lots of people. Um, all these kinds of different little things, being in a large group kind of pushes, it push, has pushed me over the last couple years of camp ministry and continues to push me. Um, yeah, those are a couple things about leadership development. Awesome. Uh, one of our strategic priorities at Westwood is leadership development. And so you can see how partnering with another organization like Nestle Bible Camp provides an amazing opportunity to develop young leaders. Caitlin. Hi, th hi there. So Caitlin's kind of gone through even further kind of stages of, of leadership development at Nestle. So tell us, Caitlin, uh, what's your role? And then how is, uh, how is camp ministry um, forming you spiritually? Yeah, so this year I took on the position of head leader at Nestle Bible Camp. So me along with a, another uh, volunteer, so his name is Michael, uh, we oversee all of the cabin staff. So all of our cabin leaders, our LITs, part of the work crew program. Um, and we really oversee uh, building up our leaders. We do a lot of training with them, a lot of guidance, a lot of encouragement. Um, and then when they're struggling with campers, uh, we're kind of their first pit stop. Uh, so sometimes I have a lot of conversations about name calling uh, amongst our campers so much. Uh, but it's also really cool. Uh, we get to see them grow and disciple them as leaders, which is really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I, I probably could ask all of you something, but not all of you want to say something. And that's mm -hmm. totally okay. Um, but you'll see, this, this is some of the crew up here. We got, uh, we got Grandpa Tony here off to the right. He's going to be up there next uh, week. Um, just being present for kids, praying, being available for kids. Um, his presence is a huge blessing to the camp. We've got Pastor David. He's a cabin leader this next week, but he's also, I guess he's drive, driven a little bus. Not a lot, but a little bit. You'll see the three buses outside that are kind of getting far and back and forth. And, uh, and some, you know, others of you, uh, we have uh, the whole Schultz family was driving bus uh, last couple of weeks, and we're excited about that. They're camping this week, so they couldn't be here. But this is a little bit of kind of what we're doing at Nest Lake and trying to support Nest Lake uh, Bible Camp. So let me um, ask you, Elliot. Elliot's the executive director of Nest Lake Bible Camp. Um, Nest Lake's been around for a lot of years in, in Prince George. Uh, as you kind of observe the landscape, what kind of impact is the ministry at Nest Lake having on our city? Oh, well, it's... Uh... <clears throat> I think in answer to Adriana, I think I would echo that in many ways, is that how is it not impacting the city? Uh, I, I think um, it, it just, it's, it's so huge from the, 
the kids all the way up through. You get to see these people who are going to be your church leaders uh, one day and the experience that they get. But I think of the campers that we've been doing for the last few years, the Ron Brent, uh, Harwin communities, uh, and having those campers come to camp who would never get the opportunity to come to camp, and they're coming, and they're hearing about Jesus. Uh, just, uh, you know, just all the way from actually to even... To like, it's not even Prince George. It's, it's, it's all the way across the world. There was, a couple years ago, I, a couple was visiting in, in Australia. And they came across, uh, they went to church there. And they visited with the pastor and his wife. And they found out that, believe it or not, they're from Canada. And she had ties to Nest Lake Bible Camp, where she was a leader there. And eventually, uh, she got married to this fella who wasn't a believer at the time. And came to know Christ, and now he's a pastor all the way over in Australia. So it's, I, I think, you know, as a director, when I, I've been at doing it for five years, and I knew Nest Lake Bible Camp, you know, lots of people know about it, but for me, when I ask people, do you know about Nest Lake, you know, I'm the director there, have you ever been out to camp? It's a rare thing for me to find somebody who has not been to camp at some point in time. And, and uh, the impact that it just has on these kids' lives is is huge from a little girl who the very first week uh, was 12 years old I think somewhere around that age and and they're going to chapel and she asks what's worship what's worship about I don't really get worship what what are we worshiping and it's an opportunity for our cabin leader to engage that camper at that time and to say well it's not what we're worshiping it's who we're worshiping and to begin to tell them about Jesus so uh, you know, it's, it's, it's seeds being sown, it's people coming to Christ. Uh, just one, one little quick little highlight that I thought was just so cool last week. Uh, or just on Thursday, we have our weekend meetings because it actually ends on Friday, but the last time that we can meet together because of day camps this year uh, uh, for our whole team is, is Thursday night. And so we met and we're doing kind of a highlight of the week kind of deal. And one of the LITs, first time coming to camp, God just led him there. I don't know. But he's this amazing young man. And, and we go through what is the gospel, how to share the gospel, all that kind of stuff. And he, he says, I got to share the gospel. with the, I've never shared the gospel, he said, with anybody ever. And he got to share the gospel with a camper. And then he asked the question, would you like to trust Jesus? And the camper said yes. And he, let me tell you, he's on cloud nine. And, you know, he... This is his, you know, and who knows what's going to happen in the life of that camper. Who, who's that camper going to be one day, right? And, but here's this young man who is excited. He got to share the gospel. You know, he did it, and, and, and a, a life was changed. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, I, I could go on and talk for, and these guys are just such rock stars. I, they are amazing young men and women. Ian, who sang and all that served for Elliot. so many years. He got tons of worship experience. Guess where? Elliot. Or Elliot, yeah, sorry. Elliot. Ian. Ian. Did I say Ian? You said Ian. <laughs> sorry. My brother's Ian and I'm thinking Elliot Ian or whatever. So anyway, Elliot Morris, yes, got all this experience worship leading at camp. And now he's going to be, you know, probably a worship pastor somewhere down the road. Or maybe he's the next Chris Tomlin. I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Elliot. I We've just been blessed to be able to be a part of the ministry at Nest Lake, and so we're so encouraged um, with this crew and with those who aren't here with us. Um, now, God has blessed our church family richly in many, many different ways, and uh, one of those has been with financial resources, and especially last year when we really didn't know kind of where things would all go. Just recently at a congregational meeting, our congregation approved uh, the disbursement of uh, $64,000 in surplus uh, funds from 2020. And we had uh, put a team together and we, we asked this team to go and uh, to pray and to discern uh, with a lot of submissions from the congregation. Uh, what is God saying to us? How do we want to bless um, other, others and other ministries with this surplus funds? And so this team did their work. They prayed, they discerned, they came back. They made some recommendations and out of that, some decisions were made in this congregation to prove that. I want to invite Arlene Dyer uh, to come on up and to share with us. Thank you. 
You know, uh, Elliot and the rest of the team, um, when I was first asked to be part of that committee that was to discern uh, what we Westwood should do with our surplus, I was so excited. And I just jumped at the chance to see where, where God would lead. And I started to pray and uh, ask for God's wisdom and discernment and direction. And uh, it was immediately impressed on me uh, very strongly that at least part of the funds should go to help children. And we know, we all know how much Jesus loved the little children. And I like to imagine him as he walked into villages that all the little kids would come running, running to him. And he would scoop them up in his arms and he would hug them and he would bless them. And he told the adults to stand down. Not every child has the funds to go to Nest Lake Bible Camp. Not every child has parents to tell them about Jesus. But I know that this check will pay huge spiritual dividends. Many kids will get the opportunity to attend camp that couldn't otherwise. And we trust that you will put this to the very best kingdom use. And it gives me great joy. And I count this a once in a lifetime opportunity to present you with a check for $12,800. incredible. And uh, now I'd just like to pray for you and bless you. Father, you are our provider. You are rich beyond compare. And you have blessed us, Westwood, with this surplus funds. And I just pray, Lord, for Elliot and his team that this would be put to your kingdom use. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you would give them wisdom and direction as they go ahead for the summer. And I pray, Lord, protection uh, for them against uh, anyone or anything that would stop little children from coming mm. to know you. And I <clears throat> just pray, Lord, that most of all, that through the, this team and Elliot, that you would bless them with just your love for every child that attends Nest Lake. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Feel free to have a seat and um, make sure before the evening or before the morning is done that you actually say hi to one of these uh, young leaders and you've seen some faces, you know who to pray for, and I'd invite you to uh, pray for our young uh, camp workers uh, over the course of the summer. It's a, it's a long summer. It's a tiring summer. It's a hot summer so far. And so we need God's uh, grace for them. Um, I, want you to, uh, I want you to turn uh, to the person around you. Maybe it's your family member. Um, and I want you to, as we look to God's word this morning, I want you to take uh, one minute and quickly describe a story where, where you got so angry, you just lost it, okay? A story where you got so angry, you just lost it. What happened, and how did you deal with it? Now, you might want to think about a story that happened maybe not yesterday. You probably haven't had time to process if it happened yesterday. So maybe go back a little further than yesterday. And if you're online, uh, do that with your uh, spouse or your child and take a minute to talk a little bit about um, your emotions getting away on you.
Now that I got you started talking, you're not going to be able to finish. Perhaps you can, perhaps you can carry that conversation on at the conclusion of this uh, message and help, help each other uh, maybe process uh, some of those, those experiences. Um, so we've had an opportunity, we've had an opportunity to, to declare our worship to God, our, our, our voice. We're giving a voice to um, God as being the one who is over us and is worthy of our worship. We've given opportunity to give voice to God working among us and through us and in us. And isn't it amazing to be able to hear the stories of faith that God is doing, whether it's... Um, whether it's through how a song came to be uh, from Elliot Morris, whether it's listening to some of our camp uh, stories, um, God is actively working, and he's in us and through us. And, and now we want to kind of shift our attention to, to giving voice to what God uh, wants to say to us through his, through his word. And we're in this series on the life of David. We've been spending um, the last weeks, and we'll, we'll work through summer, uh, in First and Second Samuel, looking at the life of David, this, this man who was given this amazing title, you know, a man after God's own heart, and yet, as we've been discovering, David is in many respects a lot like us, or we're a lot like David. I, I don't know which way you want to kind of look at it, but, but David isn't otherworldly. He's not kind of out there, untouchable, he's actually a lot like us, and we're a lot like him. Very, very human, and very, very interested in pursuing God, but certainly far from perfect. Um, you know, uh, the guy was, as a young teenager, he was, he, was a, he was a nobody. He was the youngest in a, a large family of uh, older brothers. Uh, he was forgotten by his dad. He was looked down on by his brothers. That's some of your stories. That's some of our stories where we can actually connect and relate to David. And we've, we discovered that God actually sees differently. He doesn't always look at the best. He doesn't always look at the brightest. He doesn't always look at the older or the, the more experienced, the better looking folk. He looks at some of the ordinary and he chooses them to do the task that he's called them to do. A lot of people can relate to that. A lot of people can relate to David's zeal for God, for his desire to worship God with all his heart, with all his mind, with all his strength. But sometimes we live off spiritual highs. And we look at David's life and we wonder, man, sometimes it looks like he's kind of living his life on spiritual highs and spiritual lows. Some days he is just kind of totally on track, walking with Jesus, we would say, doing what God wants from him. In other days, not so much. Great highs, great lows. Days of good decision making, days of bad decision making. Sometimes he grabbed the reins of his life and he just, you know, did what he felt right or felt good at the time, regardless of what God thought. And then sometimes, he actually handed the reins over to God. Can anyone relate to this kind of living, to that kind of life? That was David's life. And that's probably, if we're honest, our lives. Um, the story we're looking at today is, is one where David absolutely loses it. He's so angry that he just wants to take anything and everything out in his path. And we go, really? This is a man after God's own heart? And he's so angry that he can't see straight? That he just, he just wants to kind of annihilate everything in front of him? But then I think about the times that I've done stupid things. <laughs> I think about the times where I've overreacted and I've, I've responded in emotional ways or I've acted out so strongly on my emotions that I'm going, Really? Where did that come from? I've done dumb things, said dumb things. Probably some of those stories were starting to be shared even here as you were talking with the person around you. Why do we do that? Why do we respond in those kinds of ways? Well, 
Sometimes it's youthfulness. <laughs> we just aren't very mature. Sometimes it's a bruised ego. And it just kind of, whatever experience we had, it kind of touched us the wrong way. Sometimes it's trying to make a point or regain control when I think I'm losing control. Sometimes it's because I'm stressed out. And we do things, we say things that kind of just come out from us and we go, wow, where did that come from? Just a couple of weeks ago, um, one of our neighbors in our, in our neighborhood um, kind of did something which was kind of funny, but it was kind of, he lost it. So he is a neighbor that enjoys his grass as much as I enjoy my grass. Uh, again, it's the green grass growing on the lawn, not the other grass, okay? <laughs> so, and he has, um, he has, he loves his grass and he takes care of it and he actually takes care of the, the city grass as well and, you know, wants to make sure it's nice and green and lush. Um, and he has these little signs that he puts up along the sidewalk, uh, little, little signs, little doggy signs, and uh, doggies kind of squatting, and then he has these big words with an exclamation mark, no! And he has these little signs <laughs> all along the sidewalk. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the neighbors with said dogs are going to actually abide by that, right? And so there was these spots, and these spots were getting more and increasing all along the sidewalk. And finally, one day, he just loses it. And he loses it on Facebook, our Facebook kind of uh, community. Um, what do you call that thing again? Uh, your, your, like, focus, not focus group, your, your, your group, your, your <laughs> Facebook group. And, um, and he just loses it, totally loses it. And he's calling people with their dogs, this, that, and the other thing. And he's asking rhetorical questions. And he's just dropping bombs left and right and, and just loses it. And, of course, you can imagine what that did on our neighborhood <laughs> Facebook page. Uh, just totally blew up. Why? Just because. Something triggered him, and he just loses it. Unless you're, unless you're an absolute golden child here this morning, the question is not whether you have acted or reacted in irrational, uh, stupid ways, immature ways, for we all have, maybe even we have today. The real question for a disciple of Jesus when we find ourselves in situations that just trigger us and where we're about to lose this, when we are about to let our emotions get the best of, it, best of us, is how can we grow from an experience like that? How can we move forward as a disciple of Jesus? How does Jesus want to use that experience, an experience, quite frankly, which is often embarrassing when we reflect back on it? Like, would you agree? When you've given it a little bit of time and a little bit of thought, probably a little embarrassing to think about it. How does Jesus want to use it to refine my character? So in this story, in 1 Samuel 25, if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to, to take them. Um, I want you to consider your own life, and I want you to ask yourself, where do I fit into this story? Have I ever been one of these characters? Which one? And what does it tell me about myself? What does it tell me about my spiritual journey? What does it say about God's work within me and how he wants to refine me and shape me? Uh, 1 Samuel 25, I'm going to read the first uh, nine verses or so. Now Samuel died and all Israel assembled and mourned for him and they buried him at his home in Ramah. Then David moved down to the desert of Maon. A certain man in Maon who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband, a Calebite, was surly and mean in his dealings. While David was in the desert, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent ten young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. 
Now I hear that it's sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable toward my young men since we come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name. And then they waited. So there's three main characters in this story. David, Nabal, and Abigail. David's been living in the wilderness with his band of 600 men. Discouraged, discontented, indebted men. And they're loyal. They're loyal to David. The wilderness, which is kind of where this story is set, was filled with all kinds of um, folks who were troublemakers and thieves. So David, with his band of 600 brothers, you know, takes uh, the opportunity to protect a group of shepherds who worked for Nabal, a very wealthy landowner and rancher. Now, the Hebrew word for Nabal means fool. I'm guessing that's not his name by birth. I'm guessing it's a nickname that was given to him, right? Like what parent, I see some new parents in here today, you, what, what parent would actually call their kid fool? But this is this guy's name. This is how he is known. And the Bible defines a fool as someone who is unapproachable, unteachable, arrogant, selfish, and hard-hearted. You've probably known someone like this. Maybe you have been this person in the past. Nabal is obstinate. And this hardness of heart becomes a major theme in this story. And Nabal is married to Abigail. Intelligent, beautiful, winsome. And we look at that and we go, huh, bit of a mismatch perhaps. What did she see in him and what did he see in her and all that kind of how that works. So David's operating this, this neighborhood crime watch program free of charge. And he's got 600 hungry soldiers who could not continue working for free. So he sends this committee of, of 10 men uh, with this message. Hey, in case you didn't notice, um, David's been helping you for the past few months. None of your sheep, none of your goats have been injured or stolen thanks to our boss, David. And we hear that you're shearing sheep and throwing a big party. So would you, would you give your servant David whatever you can find because we're kind of dependent? Now, it's all very polite and respectful, but think about this. Like, David, David's asking for a lot. <laughs> like, who? It'd be like me going to my, all my neighbors and just mowing their lawns, right? And then kind of after I'm done, I go back to the, the, the front of their house and I ring their doorbell and say, hey, can I get 20 bucks for like mowing your lawn? I just mowed your lawn. It's all good and everything. Um, and they look at me and go, well, what? Like I didn't ask you to mow my lawn. So no, I'm not giving you 20 bucks. It's kind of what David is doing here. And he asks for a lot. In, in McDonald's language, David is asking for 600 supersized Happy Meals. Okay? So imagine, imagine that kind of volume. But theirs was a culture of hospitality, and so it was expected that if you had the means, you would help other people out. Well, Nabal gets this message, and he's just like oozing with contempt. Right? Like he's going, what? Like, are you kidding me? Who's David? Like, never heard of the guy. He's from where? Like, Nowheresville? And why would I give anything to him? I never asked him to kind of watch over my sheep and my goats. So yes, it was a big ask, but Nabal's also pretty arrogant, and he's got no grace, right? He looked down on everyone. Well, if you're David's messengers, you know, it doesn't feel good to kind of get that kind of response from Nabal. He basically gives them a verbal beat down. But what do you do? And so they take that condescending message back to David, 
And if you remember from the very beginning of this series in David, if you were to go back to chapter 16 or so, um, do you remember how David was looked down on by his own brothers? His older, more experienced, probably better looking brothers had, you know, looked down at him and for, forgotten about him. His dad was like, oh, yeah, I do have, I do have one more son. He's the youngest, and he's, but he's just a little boy. Back 40, playing with sheep, throwing stones. And then Nabal adds insult to injury. And David just loses it. Like, maybe the heat's getting to him, right? It's out in the wilderness. It's been hot. Maybe the heat's getting to him. Maybe David is tired of running and hiding from Saul. And he's been doing this for several years now. Remember, he's, he's running and hiding from Saul for about a decade. Maybe he just finally wanted somebody to give him a break. Whatever the trigger was, David blew up absolutely lost it. And frankly, Bible translators often try to hide how angry David really was. We, um, we read this story, and uh, we're reading the words on the page, and we're going, oh yeah, David got upset, okay, okay. Ah, uh, no, it's more than that. So this is what the text says, verse 22. God this is David speaking here. God, do so to the enemies of David, and more also, if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. And we go, oh, okay, so he wants people killed, I guess, or something like that. Well, do you know, the literal translation of the word male, so this is the, the Hebrew translation of the word male is one who urinates against the wall. That's... <laughs> Like, I'm not, I'm not joking. Like, that's, that's real, right? Okay? One who urinates against the wall. It's a phrase that's used elsewhere in the Old Testament when a village is going to be wiped out because of their disobedience to Yahweh. And you're wondering, well, why in the world, Rob, would you actually share that rather vivid detail? Because it's got a lot of color to it, right? Um, you kind of can imagine that. Here's why. The Bible is a real book. It is shockingly raw. It treats even its heroes with earthy spirituality. And God speaks to us through his word. However raw and however real it is. And we sometimes try so hard to be prim and proper. We come to God with our Sunday best. We try to clean ourselves up and be decent and nice. We're not sure if we can be honest with God about our true emotions, our feelings, whatever they are. And what does God do? He tells us a story of one of his favorite saints, a man after his own heart who was so angry that he wanted to kill everyone who pees against a wall. In contemporary language, if you talk to millennials and Gen Zs, this is being authentic. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I really feel. And you know what? I think God can handle that. Last Sunday, if you were here, or if you were watching online, we heard many stories. People just kept coming. Many stories from our church family of the difficulties and the challenges that this past year has brought into people's lives. Loneliness, anxiety, uncertainty if other people understood their situation, infertility, significance of caring for others and the importance of that. Wow! The stories were amazing. The work that God is doing is incredible. Thank you for being vulnerable with God, and thank you for being vulnerable with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You see, if we're never, if we're never vulnerable with our feelings and our emotions, either with God or with our brothers and sisters in Christ, our relationships, quite frankly, uh, will be really, really shallow, and our discipleship 
will be stunted. We will never fully become uh, that transformed disciple of Jesus that he wants from us. We're never going to grow up. We're never going to move forward because our realness, our authenticity, both with God and his word and with others who are more mature than us, to come into our lives and speak truth into our lives, um, which spurs us in our relationship with God and his, and his people, is so critical. So it's good to be authentic. Like, don't, don't mishear me. It's good to be authentic. Being real with God and being real with others. However, however, in our realness, in our authenticity, we need to remember who God is and how he is over all things, like everything. The bad experiences that take us to the edge, the times when we just want to lose it on our kid, on our spouse, on our coworker, on our neighbor. He reigns over all things. He's bigger. I loved, I loved how Doriana Hoekstra put it last Sunday when she spoke of her past year. In speaking of the different struggles that she experienced, she, she embraced this phrase, he can, he has, and he will. He can, he has, and he will. I love that. Because life can get so difficult, and it can bring you to the edge where you wonder if you're going to lose it if you're going to be able to keep going, if you're going to be able to take that next step. And God is bigger. He can, he has, and he will. David, as in King David, not Pastor David, but King David really should have been here last Sunday to listen to Doriana because that's what David needed to hear. He's totally upset. He's totally upset. He's being dissed by a hard-hearted fool. But he's forgetting about who God is. He's forgetting that God is greater. He's forgetting the one who has called him to be the servant leader of his people. He's forgetting about the one who's always demonstrated protection and provision in his life while he's been running and hiding from Saul. In his emotional rage, David is forgetting these truths and he's, he's in danger of destroying his, his own soul. He's in danger of growing in bitterness. He's in danger of developing a, a vengeful spirit, wishing ill on other people, not believing the best in others, letting those thoughts fester. He's, he's being tempted to take control over his life and doing things his way, instead of God's way, because, well, if no one else is going to look out for you, I guess I got to do it. No one else is going to do it, so I guess I'm going to take the reins. You've been there. I've been there. Maybe we're still at that place. And sometimes, quite frankly, in our humanity, we like stewing in our emotions, thinking about revenge, thinking ill about other people, reliving the past because we think it's somehow therapeutic for our soul. But that's not what God wants. That's not where God wants us. That's not where God wanted David. You see, if we're more like David than we care to imagine, but it's our heart's desire, like David's, to move toward God, how can we grow? How can we allow bad experiences, negative experiences, experiences that take us to the edge and want us to just kind of, just completely destroy everything in our pathway, how can we grow from those? How can we allow Jesus to kind of shift our sight, to, to move our eyes upward and forward to look to him, where, where we're taking sight of who God is, and we're not losing sight of who God is. Where we're um, looking at him, and we're, we see him in our situation. Where we see him controlling our emotions and our responses to our emotions. How can we grow, and how can we be reframed from our experiences? Where, where our bitterness, quite frankly, is replaced with, with betterness. 
I want to suggest this morning, as we think about this and as we move forward and try to apply it, that we think about several very, very practical aspects of this story. The first is this. We need to remember who we are and whose we are. We need to remember who we are and whose we are. Nabal's servants, this fool, his servants knew that their boss had just offended a leader of 600 Hell's Angel wannabes. I mean, that's, that's what these guys are. And so they went to Abigail and they told her the story. Nabal is nuts. He has the means. He doesn't want to feed the guys. No one can talk to him. Abigail knew exactly what her servants were talking about. She's been living with the guy for years. Probably has covered for him many times. And then she does it again. Verse 24. On me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servants speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. This, this is the key to the entire passage. Nabal doesn't give a rip of who David is or how David's feeling. Doesn't know his story, doesn't really care. Nabal doesn't listen to anybody because that's the way of a fool. That's what the Bible says. But David, David's also acting like a fool. He's also on the edge, on the brink of completely losing sight of who he is and whose he is. He's forgetting where God is in his situation. He can, he has, he will. So Abigail takes this huge risk. Like this must have been a huge risk for her. And she says to David, verse 28, Please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord because you fight the Lord's battles. And no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies, he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. When the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, my Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. And when the Lord your God has brought my Lord's success, remember your servant. Can you imagine? This is Abigail, the mismatched wife of a fool, and she calls David out. Fight the Lord's battle, she says. Stop the pettiness with my foolish husband. Live up to your calling. You're a child of God. Your enemies will be hurled aside as a stone is thrown from a sling. When was the last time we heard about a stone being hurled from a sling? When David killed Goliath. And Abigail is saying, David, God started a good work within you, and he's not finished yet. God expects more from you. Don't forget that. And seven times in that speech, which I think is the longest speech in the Old Testament by a woman, Abigail uses the Lord's name. And what does she do? She reminds David of who God is. She reminds David of his calling on David. His promises to David, his choice of David, his perfect timing for David's life. Wow, that's gutsy. Imagine. And here David is, stewing in his emotions, who wants to kill everyone who pees against the wall. Will he listen to Abigail, remembering who he is and whose he is, or will he refuse and live like Nabal, the fool? Here's the deal. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are also a child of God. You are in Christ, and Christ is in you. 
And our foremost calling above everything else as children of God is to be like Jesus who is forming us and shaping us in, into his personal workmanship. The fruit of the Spirit is being developed in you and through you in increasing measure so that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control is being evidenced in your life and throughout your life in greater and greater measure. In Christ, you have access to all of those qualities. All of them. Because the Spirit of God is at work in you and through you. Do not forget this. Without the Spirit of God, without the Spirit of Christ, without our identity rooted in Jesus, we would all live like Nabal. But thanks be to God, we don't have to. But that doesn't mean we're not going to get tempted to get derailed, almost like David did. When I think back over my life, there's, there's one particular, particular situation that happened to me a number of years ago where, where I have to be very, very careful in my thoughts. And I have to remember this reality that Abigail shares with David. Remember who you are and remember whose you are. I was maligned and undermined in my pastoral leadership. I was looked at sideways with skepticism. I even had my relationship with Jesus questioned. At first, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And then, I just wanted bad things to happen to these people. Kind of like David. Man, those were, those were tough days. And if I let myself stew on that experience the bitterness can come back. The anger can come back. But that's not what God wants. And that's not what I want. I want to get better, not bitter, not on my own strength, but because of Jesus. So I remember who I am in Christ. I'm deeply loved by one who has called me to serve him and his bride. And I remember whose I am. I'm a child of God. I am being formed. Yes, my life is imperfect, but I'm being formed into his likeness, and he's leading me according to his purposes and not mine. And that's what God wants from you as well. Remember who you are and remember whose you are. And then we need to be teachable. Do you remember what his servants said about Nabal? He's such a worthless man that one cannot speak to him. What a, what a sad commentary. When we've got a bad experience, when we're on the verge, ready to lose it, a defining mark of our character is how are we going to respond. A fool is unteachable and uncorrectable. They refuse criticism and correction. They get defensive. They deflect criticism back on you. We've probably all done that. <laughs> Bi the Bible says in Proverbs, whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, and he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Don't reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. To paraphrase, foolish people say, who are you to tell me how to live my life? And that was, quite frankly, David's initial response. Bruised ego, not thinking too much about God. I don't think he was even thinking about 600 hungry men. I think he was frustrated. Running, hiding, trying to do good, and getting slapped in return. And Abigail takes this huge risk by speaking to David. But who really wants to process their feelings in moments like that? We want revenge, not reflection. <laughs> but here's, here's the deal. Our greatest temptation in times like these will be to focus on our bruised egos and our unresolved issues and our hurt feelings. How are we going to respond in that moment? Nabal did what Nabal 
does. David was going to do what Nabal does. And then he paused long enough to listen and willing to be corrected. And he was willing to be corrected from a surprising source an unarmed woman in the midst of a male-dominated violent culture. I want you to think about your own tendencies and habits in this regard because you and I will stay stuck in certain areas of our discipleship with Jesus until we receive and even ask for correction. Correction that may come from surprising sources. Are we teachable? Well, ultimately, the Bible's not written to be a self-help book or a self-improvement story. The Bible is a redemption story. Some, something or someone from the outside comes and offers to redeem us, to lift us from the mess that we find ourselves in. Before God, all of us are like Nabal and David. Romans 5 tells us that, that we're fools, we're enemies of God. We're bent on destruction. We're prone to losing it. Prone to let our emotions get the best of us. Prone to walk away. Maybe not to murder a ranch owner and his workers, but our hearts are predisposed to wander away and we need help. We need someone to come and to help us in our despair. And that, of course, is the good news of Jesus who came to save us. So the most important question is not, have I lost it? And have I done something that was stupid and where my anger got the best of me and I was a total fool? The the ultimate question is not that, because we've all been there. The more important question to consider in light of our personal faults and tendencies But then in light of who we are in Christ and whose we are is to to bring our lives, the good, the bad, the ugly, and we ask Jesus to redeem it for his glory and our good. To continually transform us. To take the foolishness, to take the stupidity, to take the anger, the vengeful, the bitter spirit, the festering thoughts, all of it. We cannot do it on our own. We need someone else, and that someone is Jesus who can do it for us. So we need to embrace redemption. To actually say, yes, Lord, I need your help. I can't do this on my own. I want to become more and more like you. And today I'm starting fresh. And you know what? Jesus is more, more than willing to take us where we're at and to start that work within us. Let me close in prayer. And if God is speaking to you in some way, you think about these characters, you think about some of the themes, allow the Spirit of God to show you what He wants from you for your next step. And if you'd like prayer, I am more than willing to pray with you and join me at the front as we conclude our service. Lord, we just commit our our time to you. We thank you so much that uh, you've been with us, and what an encouragement to be able to hear from you, to praise you, to worship you, to see what you're doing um, throughout our our city, throughout our our ministries. And so today we just, we give you praise. We pray that your spirit would speak to us and guide us, uh, help us to become more and more um, like you, to take those troubling areas, the times, the spots where we're tempted to just do our own thing and left to our own devices and our own emotions, Lord, we know that, um, that we're just going to do whatever our, our selfish and our sinful desires will do. So Lord, I pray for each one that you would help them to take the next steps in whatever you have for them. And we ask that you would go with us and bless us and encourage us for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we can close our worship service this morning, um, Cam's just going to play Refiner's Fire, and if you want to remain here and just reflect and, and uh, worship the Lord, feel free to do that. If you'd like prayer, I'm going to be at the front and would love to pray with you. Um, and, uh, and then enjoy, 
enjoy the, the day. Enjoy uh, the week that God has for you. Make sure that you um, encourage some of our young camp workers and, and bless them uh, because God is doing a great work. So God bless you. Hey, Robert.